Good morning. First, I should say it's, it's tough being up against um, Emery and Pete in the other room doing their fantastic colour graphical visualisation, so I appreciate you sticking around and listening to me. So um, what I'm going to just have a bit of a talk today about is rapid GIS data collection using 360, cam 360 cameras, and I'm just going to talk about a, cap a couple of case studies that, um, that we've done over the last um, year, and hopefully from that you'll get a bit of an idea of where... Um, rapid data collection and 360 cameras can fit into the, to the larger picture of um, data collection. So I'll quickly talk about um, what is rapid data collection. I'll quickly talk about some hardware. I've got some hardware here, some software, and then the case studies, and then just some ideas on what's next, what, what next can we do with it. So I'll start off is, you know, why would we use uh, rapid data collection using 360 cameras? Well, on the, on the ground, data capture, as you know, is, is, is quite time consuming. By using a 360 camera, you can rapidly uh, collect data. You have the ability to capture and uh, capture near real time, post events, quickly and efficiently. And you can do it multiple times. Um, as you know, desktop editing is, is difficult, fraught with issues, and, the, and can be, again, um, time consuming. Um, I guess one of the other great things about um, using 60 cameras is that they're, they're rugged, cost-effective hardware, can be used in the rain, they can be used anywhere, they can be dropped, again, great fit in the field, um, reasonable battery life, and of course the great thing being the, the Phosphor G is most of the software is open and free and, and able to be um, used. I guess one of the things, and I think it was great listening to Carol's um, keynote this morning around um, respect and traditional practice, I guess the key here is it's not so much um, is the ability for local people to learn very quickly to be able to take this, this sort of equipment out to the field and uh, you know empower the local community. They can collect the data as and when needed, respecting local cultural um, norms on that. I guess the good example in here is a picture. I spent a little bit of time in Kiribati not too long ago. Um, I'm sure it's familiar with some of you, with the KWIM group, and, and quickly, within 30 minutes, had them collecting data using um, a 360 camera. And I guess I see this as, you know, local, local um, capacity or cap capability uh, building. I always have a favourite saying, it's, it's, in my way, it's removing the fat white guy from the process. And what I mean by that is, is passing on the knowledge and letting the local people decide how and when they collect the data and just having the right tools at the right time to be able to um, do that. Um, I think one of the great things about 360 cameras is immersive Im imagery, and I'll give you a quick example here. Um, here's an example. Um, actually, this is um, Fiji, um, just outside Nandi, and this is just collected again from the roof of a, excuse my mouse thing, you get a bit of an idea of what can be collected in, in, in one image and then how you can, um, you know, how immersive that is, picking up street signs, road markings, um, light posts, trees and, and things like that. So the hardware, so we've been kind of collecting data like this for many years, um, thanks to Ed's here. So a few years ago, I got a grant, uh, Mapuri supplied a Hero Pro 7, I think it was, and started collecting data around Queensland on a motorbike, on a pole. Um, but I quickly realised that, that the, we need to capture more data than how we do it. So I went out and brought what was called a Garmin Verb at the time. This, this device up here at the time for state art. Which is a bit expensive, it's a bit clunky, and it didn't didn't work that well. It, it worked it worked well enough, but it just wasn't reliable enough. Then um, GoPro came out with what was called the, the GoPro Max, which is a 360 camera like this, waterproof, um, good battery life. You get at least two hours out of the battery, um, and uh, works quite well. Um, very reliable. Um, so. What I did then is I wanted to build a mount, so what I did was use a company called Ram Mount. Um, 
so they've got that just clips onto the roof like that, built the pole, and then just clips on the roof like that, and then you've got a steady um, way to um, collect data. In terms of power, the Garmin Verbo actually, you can actually plug in an external power, and then I just created a circuit like that and plugged it in the car, so you could just run it 24-7, but unfortunately the Garmin Verb was overheat, um, so it didn't, didn't work so well. With the um, GoPro Connect Power, and you've actually got to open that up so it doesn't become really, it's not water resistant anymore so if you want to have external power and it's a USB-C cable. So the easiest way I found to, to power it was just by a 12 volt charger with two more batteries in it. That just sits in the car. Every hour and a half or two hours you just pull the battery out, change it in, and it takes about two hours to charge one battery. So that works for a day. Um, it works all day without a, um, a problem on that. So I should say that there are other options to collect data. Um, you can just use a standard mobile phone with an Apillary app on there. Um, in fact, you still still give away the mounts. You still got those plastic mounts? Yeah, 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 yeah little plastic mounts you can mount on the windscreen. Um, you can use dash cams, and I'll talk about that later, and even cars now come with little inbuilt cameras, and there's a couple of hacks how you can pull the um, um, that data out there. But again, coming back, to this, this is a rugged, rugged, easy to use device, and um, I think it's the the best way to um, capture data. Talk about software. So what I'll do is I'll go through and step through this in a little bit more detail. But um, obviously, the software to view and and and, and manage the capture data I use Mapillary. Here's the head sitting over here from Mapillary. Um, QGIS, of course, and some plugins. Um, but we actually use, also use GoPro Player, and that comes down to a bit of a workflow issue. Um, as well as publishing to Mapillary, so we've got that open, um, open and easy way for people to consume the data, you can also publish to Google Street View. And people, people would go, why would you want to publish to Google Street View? Well, there's a lot of people who aren't geospatial, they don't think about things in the same way that most people in this room think about, but they know Google. So we can also take this content and upload it to um, Google, but there's a, a second step process. Um, Mapillary make it really easy. Just drag and drop into the Mapillary app on your on your laptop, and it uploads. With to do it for Google, you've got to use the Google Pro Player, export a different format, and up, upload. And I'll, I'll show you a couple. A um, couple other um, pieces of software I find really handy. You saw FSP Viewer that I just showed before. That's available both on PC and Mac. So it allows you to view your um, your 360. Um, imagery. I use something else on a PC called GeoSetter, and that's just a great way to manage all your geolocated photos. You can see it on a map, and it gives you a good, um, gives you a good way to sort and um, manage um, photos. So um, what I'll do now is give you a bit of an example. So what I want to do is talk about the first case study was Nauru. So um, a few months ago, I was up on Nauru. I was, um, I was working with a colleague. I was part of a larger ADB-funded um, project around climate resilience in the, in, the, in the Pacific. And part of this was collecting data. My colleague had uh, collected um, drone data over the whole island, and I managed to collect the whole country in seven hours. So that, I don't know whether that's a record, Ed, in terms of collecting a whole country. Nara is pretty small, and I'll show you in a second. But being able to collect all that data really quickly, and um, and then being able to process and then use that to edit um, um, OpenStreetMap. Um, I guess a couple of things that come out of this too was straight away we realised there was no. It was about trying to build local capability in the island, and what we wanted to do is is use the model that that was working in Kiribati for, for KDRM and the Kiribati woman in, in mapping um, to see if we can replicate that model. In Nauru, and it may be, but we'll get some of the KWM people to come down to Nauru for a week and, and pass on there what they've done to to um, set that up. So what I'll just show quickly, if I can get all this working, um, I'll start with QGIS. So does everybody know where Nauru is? Right in the right in the middle of it. I know a couple. Of, who's who's been to Nauru? Just Carol. Yep. Okay. So Nauru is right in the right in the middle of the right in the middle of the Pacific. Um, 
that's not Nauru. I'm. It's will be my internet connection. Um, so give us a second here, and I'll, I'll find a, a, a better map how it does. There we go. So Nauru has been in the news, of course. I think over the last ten or fifteen years, particularly around the refugee processing centres, which they have three. Some people from processing centres, some people from prisons. Um, I think it's a, a mix of both, which is in the middle, middle, middle of the um, middle of the island here. So, um, see if I can overlay. So this is some um, drone imagery. So over over a period of um, two and a half weeks, ca captured drone imagery of all the island. This this bit's all, also completed. It just haven't pros just hasn't been processed. So it gives you an idea a bit of the coverage. So what I'll do is I'll s slip back to Mapuri really quickly. And um, so here's, here's Mapuri, here's, here's the Mapuri app. So you can see straight away, um, I don't know where it's, where you can see the green on there. No, it's, 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 it's a bit washed out. Maybe it's better on the uh, uh, TV there. But you can get an idea there and you can see that all the data that's captured on there and then you can see quite quickly um, um, how, how it can be captured and how it can be viewed in Mapuri. But that, to me, that's the eye candy. That's kind of, hey, that looks cool. We can do all that. What the, where the power of Mapuri comes from is the fact that it uses a bit of AI, and, and I'm sure you can talk to Ed afterwards and give you a bit more of a lowdown on it, but it's the fact that you can pull in... Um, you can pull in um, attributes like signs and things like that. So using the s smarts behind the scenes from that imagery, it's creating um, creating um, signs and, 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 and things like that. So we can, if we click, So then you can see now, you can start seeing it's identifying power poles, signs, um, driveways, and, and, and things like that. And then we can export that, st export that um, either into one of your um, OSM editing tools or into um, QGIS. So I can show you back in QGIS here. So if I turn on um, points layer, you can now see um, these these different points. Now, Mapillary used to, or someone, a third party wrote a really good plugin um, for Mapillary, allowed you to bring the Mapillary data directly into, um, into um, QGIS. Um, Mapillary updated the API, um, and unfortunately the, the plugin, um, plugin's not working anymore. And that was a great way you could, you could bring it up. There are some other third party tools. I got them working on my PC, but for some reason, I'm not a big Python user, and I mucked up my Python environment on the Mac, so uh, I, I couldn't get it working. But um, I think there's um, the there is a Mapillary viewer for ArcGIS Pro, and I think it'd be great to see if we could do some crowdfunding and, and get a, um, a Mapillary viewer working um, for QGIS um, on there. So we can view this in a couple other ways. So the, similar in using JOSM. So I use that a lot. It's a Java, uh, a Java app that allows you to bring in map. And again, you can bring up not only the photo layers, but again, you can bring up the, those points and signs and things that we brought into um, into um, uh, we brought from Mapillary and we brought into um, QGIS. And we can also do it in. OpenStreetMap. So the same thing here. So you can just go, if I remember rightly, map data. If you just turn on Mapillary and turn on features and signs in Mapillary, and again, I've just added at the same time, I've just added a custom um, uh, a custom tile service to bring in that drone data. Um, again, you can see all the um, overlays in here. 
and things a bit slow, um, but that drone image will come up in a second. And then you can, within this, you, you can edit using that, that information. And theoretically, if I get further down, I can click and bring up just what I want. You can, again, see what's happening there. And it makes it easier to add and, and edit your data um, within, um, uh, within the OpenStreetMap ID uh, editor. Um, so I, I, a couple other things to note here, and I think this comes back to Carol's talk as well. So although we clicked for the whole island, there's some things that we haven't uploaded. We've made um, a, available privately um, to local government. No things of, of traditional cultural heritage, but also for example, there's, um, and Carol knows very well, there's some housing that's been built down by the port was used for the indentured labourers many years ago, but it's, it, it, it's, a, it's pretty messy, it's a, it's a slum. But we captured that because locally they're going to need that to help rebuild, but it wasn't something that they felt comfortable being on the, on the public interweb to, to do. So I think that comes back to just being mindful of, of data and, and you know, having local people with us, it, you know, made it a little bit easier to, to work out um, what was appropriate to collect and, and, and not collect. Um, how am I going for time? I've got three minutes, okay. So I've got a, a, another case, th who knows where Thursday Island is? The two Australians in the, in, in the country. Thursday Island is the very, very top of, of course, yes. Uh, very, very top of Cape York um, and part of Queensland. Um, I was up there for another project, but I had a day off, so I took my camera with me, I zipped around and, and pulled it, um, pull, pulled some information. Let me see if I can... Um, um, again. Exactly the same thing. I brought in a, here's a here's a tab app. I, I should say Queensland have a fantastic streaming imagery and and um, uh, topographic service, but I just wanted to use the map as context. And um, again, same same concept. Now to bring in that that content, um, give you another bit of example of that. I wanted to show you the Google Maps version of this. So we added this onto Google Map. So now um, created a complete. Google Street View of um, Thursday Island. And again, that's helpful for those people who may not be in our kind of industry or community, but know Mapilla and things like that. Everybody knows Google Google Maps, and we've already got some feedback on how that's um, being used. But that's also in Mapilla and things like that. So I wanted to wrap this up really quickly um, by just going through some uh, final things. So. I guess what's next is there's three things. First is funding to get these cameras out into the field, get people using them. Again, they're easy to use, it's 30 minutes training, and then people can collect data as and when needed, you know, and then make it. And what's particularly great about this is, you know, being able to do it quickly, especially post, post disaster or things like that. Um, the only downside really is you need an internet connection at some point to get that data from your local PC to the internet, but that's becoming easier. I think the other thing that's looking um, quite promising, I've been playing around with this, is being able to create your digital twin and your 3D, 3D views from um, the 360 imagery. So this is an example of a guy in Sydney um, done, again, just riding on his bicycle along the streets of Sydney. Um, I've been playing with the stuff that I pulled out of both Nara and Kiribati, and haven't got to this point yet. It's quite process intensive, but I think there's some ideas there around Again, a, a very cheap sensor to be able to um, pick this data up. The other thing we talked about is it'd be great to see if we can get some funding to put together a plugin. Now, I'll update the plugin so we can bring this imagery directly into QGIS. I think that would make a, a, a big difference. Last thing I want to talk about um, is a lot of cars have um, cameras built into them now. Tesla is a really good example. So there's some hacks. Search on the net. Some hacks, someone's built a nice little and, and, and droido box, hooks into the cameras, it's got a modem, adds GPS to it, automatically uploads the, the imagery to um, Mapillary.
So dead on time. Thank you. Any questions? Um, well, I guess for somewhere like Nauru, which is, you know, a, a fairly simple network to map, um, it, it's not a, not a good example. But um, do you use like sort of route planning software? How, how do you figure out um, how to plan your yep. route and make sure you capture everything? Really good. Well, even even for Nauru, you have to use route planning because it's, so I actually use an app on my um, I got an iPhone, but use Android. I use something called Guru Maps. The good thing about Guru Maps is it has already has an OSM vector database you can download and put on the map. But you can also bring in your own raster imagery, whether that's imagery or things. So before I go somewhere, I get there all that, I, I build the maps in QGIS, move it to um, Guru Maps, and then have it all in there. Then I set the tracking on, and then I can, I'm happy to show you afterwards. Uh, then I can see, I have that in the car, and I can see exactly where I've been and where I haven't been on that. G, G U R U. I want to ask you a question. You mentioned um, originally that you used a GoPro on your motorbike. Yes. Um, Phil Wyatt does a lot of capture in Tasmania. Yes, he does. From Mapillary. Yep. But he doesn't ride a motorbike, and there are a lot of roads in Tasmania that um, are um, unsealed. And he's asked Glenn to go out, because Glenn rides his V-Stream on yep. those roads. He's asked him to capture it. So... Um, you, this assembly you've put together to put on the roof of a car, yep. is it simple to uh, customise that? M more than happy to talk to Glenn and give him, so um, I ride a similar bike to what Glenn does, so mm. I just have a, a mount that sits on a, a crash bar on the front. I use the G uh, GoPro Hero, which is just a, a one thirty degree. That's view at the what front. I was going to ask. It's not a yep. three sixty. It's not a three sixty. No, yep. but there's no reason. Some people actually mount them on top of their helmets. Yeah, I have seen. So that riders these way, the problem with that though is, is a lot of it's heavy. Well, it's not so much heavy. It's a lot of moving around, yep. and so you just don't get that consistency on a car or mounted. And to be honest, for the great thing about three sixty is you get three sixty with, mm. with the front of view. You're only seeing the front. Okay. And it's you know, it's nice to see that uh, uh, but you but could mount two cameras too. On the surface, yeah. sorry, the uh, the type of road that we're talking about, you're not going to have all the features that the asset capture that you would want to do. You're talking more about um, uh, only k the key features of signs, maybe, and buildings. Because true, uh, but yeah. there's other things like gates, culverts, okay. intersections, there? unnamed roads, and you, you don't want to stop. You no. want to keep going, but oh, then you can go back and go, oh, I know that road. I now mm -hmm. can look on a map and, and see, yeah. is it a public road? Is it a private road? I'm just thinking, um, is, it, is it a value still to Mapillary to have that uh, unsealed road captured? For access in disaster. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Yep, thanks. All right, more questions? Anybody want to elaborate? Yes. Um. Thanks for flagging the QGIS plugin. So that was something that, as Greg mentioned, uh, stopped working when Mapillary updated the API. But I think it would be really, really interesting to fund further development of it. So if anyone is a QGIS developer here and is interested in making a street level imagery plugin that can host 360 imagery, I think that's something that could be funded and funded work and, and incredibly valuable for the community. Um, I think there are some issues around JavaScript in QGIS, like the Mapillary viewer is all JavaScript based, but if someone is able to figure that out and build a plugin, it would be um, super valuable. So thanks for mentioning that, Greg. Yep. 